but let's let's at least start with uh, with Peter Atkins and what he has to say about this. Um, Peter, we have him down described here as professor of chemistry at the University of Oxford and fellow of Lincoln College. He's actually just recently retired as those things, but I, for most of us, I, it's impossible to think of him in those terms. So he's still professor of chemistry at the University of Oxford and fellow of Lincoln College as far as we're concerned. He's the author of nearly 60 books, including Galileo's Finger, which is this extraordinary book called subtitled The Ten Great, Great Ideas of Science. And he has a new book called Four Laws That Drive the Universe. And um, uh, Peter Atkins. And one thing I should mention as we start, which I forgot, is that we have these things, which are little signs that say, you're one minute away, and you're expired. Um, I have very little hope that this will work, but... <laughs> How long have I got? To you anyway. How long have I got? Yeah, um, we, we originally <laughs> said to everybody 15 minutes. Fine. Okay, thank you. But it didn't work. No. <laughs> Nor will it. <laughs> um, well, thank you to the organisers and the sponsors for enabling me to come here. I'm going to take you on a journey from Kitch to Kitch. Um, and I, when I woke up this morning at one o'clock, um, I knew exactly how God felt, uh, but instead of uh, where, where he had flown in from infinity or outside space and time and had nothing to do, um, so he created a universe. I decided I would throw away my talk and give you a new one. <laughs> so this is um, today's talk, um, which is quite different from yesterday's. And what I'm trying to do is to in some parts of it at least, respond to the points that came up yesterday in that enthralling discussion, set of discussions we had yesterday. I've got a hundred slides, so I've got only 10 seconds about for each one. Um, and many of them are in several parts. Um, but <coughs> I'll just um, first of all tell you where I come from, that is figuratively, and I'm an old fashioned reductionist that I believe that you can take apart the universe, discover its simple components, and then put them back together again and understand the nature of the world. So really when I say that I'm a reductionist, I'm a, an assemblist, uh, because I think that's what reductionism is all about. And I, I'm not overawed by um, emergent properties or anything like that. And I think that s scientists should regard themselves as, um, as hewers of simplicity out of complexity. But that's the easy part. The difficult bit, of course, is knitting it all together again to get the engine back from, from the parts. That applies whether we're talking as the closest I could get to water at one o'clock in the morning. Um, um, e uh, it was, uh, who was it yesterday, Sean? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the wetness of water. We chemists, for that is what I am, really do understand why water is wet. We're not overawed by it. We don't need to know the positions and momenta of 6 times 10 to the 23 molecules or anything like that. We know from the nature of the molecules that water wets the surfaces that it touches. And we're not overawed by the problem of going from this reductionist view of the image I have in the background to the background itself. We can go from any set of molecules you care to, to offer us and we can understand the, the, the properties of of the substance. We can predict the properties of the substance too. There is no problem. And I'll take that even further. This is I went lurking around the hotel last night with my digital camera. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we can understand the, um, the, the, the difference between um, the, 
the, the entity on the left and the entity on the right in terms of the, the hormones that pervade their body. Of course, it gets a much more difficult problem, but we're not overawed by it. Nor are we overawed by the problem of accounting for something like this. And we can, um, and indeed, we're, we're not overawed, in principle at least, by thinking about the perceptions that that entity makes of the world, and indeed of all the properties. This is um, tonight's dinner, I'm assured. That um, we, I think I'm safe in saying, can in principle go from the molecular structure that underlies everything to the, um, to the entities that we want to talk about in terms of sensory perception and so on. Um, we can look at the world around us and we can understand it. And, uh, sorry, this is something else I will then come, come back to. And we, and we, can, um, we, we can trace the mechanism of the world. So I'm not worried by emergent properties. Take up another point that um, it was Sean, wasn't it, who was talking about um, cosmology and one's visions of the beginning. Um, I mean, this is the old-fashioned view of the universe. This next one, I think, was the image that he probably had in mind with our universe maybe down here somewhere springing from a mother universe, springing from a grandmother universe, and maybe this going on forever, or maybe whatever there is over here being something that we don't really have to explain. I think that's throwing the towel in too quickly, too soon. I think that um, certainly this may be the scenario, and certainly then it's conceivable that there was never a beginning. But we shouldn't admit that yet, otherwise we lose the fight for understanding and comprehension. I think really the, the, the short history of time that um, we should not um, avoid confronting is the one that goes on the left from absolutely nothing. And I don't mean um, just empty space or a vacuum. I mean absolutely nothing, whatever that is. Two, dead flat space time. That is the long term distant future of the universe. And what is really astonishing, I think, is that um, God, if he actually made this journey, made such a fuss about getting there because the line here that um, conceals just about everything, the emergence of the, the formation of the solar system, the uh, um, photosynthesis, uh, the election of George Bush, whatever, um, is such a meal going from absolutely nothing to dead flat space time. And so if people think that there is a purpose in the universe, then I'm afraid this diagram um, gives them at least some pause, I hope. But I think that what physicists should consider before they think about eternity is the properties of nothing at all. And um, I, I think it's not an inconceivable problem to think about what could possibly come of nothing without intervention. And um, a couple of decades ago, I, in fact, did write a, a book which included a chapter in exploring how one could go from absolutely nothing into what appears to be a state of being. But obviously what I said was total nonsense. But it, it, um, I, I think it is not inconceivable that in the future we will have, we will know the properties of absolutely nothing and be able to see how something emerges. And I will elaborate a little bit on that as I get towards the end of my, what was, whatever it was, 50 minutes. Um, if I can also take up some points of yesterday, um, it seems to me that a summary of what the pre-enlightenment is, or was, is really consists of admiration 
for two types of thought. One, of course, is um, theology, and the other is philosophy with... Um, <laughs> I'm sure Dan doesn't mind, but I had to... Uh, <laughs> I had to decorate this one to do it. I think um, if we, a symbol for going to Enlightenment one is really the destruction of theology and the retention of philosophy, but the replacement, the inclusion now of, um, of, of science as um, really a principal mode of understanding. And we, we humans should be enormously proud that we have identify this extremely simple way of understanding the truth about the world. Um, so, really, Enlightenment 2, <laughs> as, um, and I, I had to be rather, let you know that this, although um, is probably a sunset, I'd like it actually to be a sunrise on, um, on civilization. Um, it seems to me that we've got to get rid of philosophy because it really is such a ball and chain for on, on progress. And, uh, and I will say just a little bit more about what I mean. I mean, you can, I, one can always do a Turing test on, on people to discover if they are philosophers or natural scientists. Put them in a room and ask questions. And all the pessimistic answers point immediately to the philosopher. And, and all the optimistic answers point immediately to the, to the scientist. You can't be a scientist without being an optimist. Um, I don't know about being a philosopher, but philosopher is really just a, a nuisance. Um, so Enlightenment 3, which hasn't yet been mentioned today, I think science will probably survive. I have absolutely no idea what will go on this pedestal, and, um, but uh, I just invite you to think about what could replace our current mode of thinking. Another way of expressing what I've just said is, is really, I like to look around um, for icons in the everyday world so that when you go away from what I'm saying, you actually are reminded of what I've been saying. And it seems to me that this summarizes pretty well what I've been talking about. Um, first of all, you have theology, then you have philosophy, and then you have science. So in other words, theology obfuscates. Um, philosophy, really, um, I don't know what philosophy does. Uh, it, it interferes with understanding. And science illuminates. Uh, and so the sooner we get rid of philosophy. Philosophy is all right at rather a superficial level of human behavior. Um, but it has nothing to say about the fabric of reality and nothing at all to say about the, the springs of ethical behavior or anything like that. It really is um, just a nuisance, whereas science is the only way forward. Um, I'm surprised so far that no one's talked about the Internet. I know that Harry is going to, and this is just going to be a, a peg on which I think he might um, develop his um, talk. What worries me about the internet, a fantastic thing, of course, and what worries me about the internet is what worries me about the southern states of North America um, and the fact that um, sort of stupid ideas can so easily take hold. Um, I mean, the advantage of the Catholic Church is that you've got a top dog, spelt D-O-G, the wrong way around, of course. You've got a top dog. Um, with the Anglican Church, you've got a kind of central leadership, and they put out the little forest fires, excuse the illusion, that um, sometimes erupt in, in local communities. So they have a central control. But it seems to me that in North America, you don't have this sort of central control over the way people think about theological issues. And so wildfires can take, um, <laughs> Can, um, can start and they can spread. And it slightly worries me, and Harry might have something to say about this, I'm setting him up, um, that without central control, the internet really does, um, is a bit like the southern states of America and could, the, this democratization of knowledge and so on, its lack of central control could be very damaging to the enterprise of the Enlightenment. But how do we communicate? I mean, if we want to share the, the vision that we've got 
of, um, um, of science being such a fantastic way of understanding the world and the only real way of understanding the world with you know, poets maundering away and philosophers op confusing us and theologians obfuscating the only hope for the future is science. How do we, how do we get people to understand um, the notions of science? I thought I'd really press the point of view that we must use visual imagery to penetrate people's minds. I think the two holes we've got in the front of our heads are really the best way of communicating the subtle aspects of, of science. And because my time is running out, I'm going to skip the first law of thermodynamics, which I think is fantastic, um, but extraordinarily boring. Um, I want to show you that one because I spent such a long time doing it. <laughs> but I know what it means. So um, I think science really has, we should share our insight with um, the, the general public visually. And I chose two things to talk about. One is why nothing happens, which gives physicists enormous pleasure when nothing actually happens. Um, that is when there's a conservation law nothing happening at all is extremely exciting. Um, and then talk about why anything happens at all. But since my 15 minutes, there's only two minutes to run, you'll have to imagine what I was going to say. Because um, energy is conserved, what energy crisis? Then I was going to talk about symmetry. Um, and then I was going to come back to the point I made a little time ago. What is the total energy of the universe? Um, there is the universe, a little bit of it anyway. Um, and obviously, the God had a lot to do on that first day um, because of E equals MC squared, take all the mass and so on, multiply it by C squared, you get something big. And you also got all the sort of radiant energy as well. And so on. But scientists being circumspect folk also realize that there's gravitational attraction and gravitational attraction lowers the total energy. And the thought is at the moment seems to be moving towards, if you include dark energy and other fantasies and so on, that the lowering of energy due to gravitational attraction exactly cancels. So instead of God having to do a great deal on day one, um, or day zero, as I suppose it was, um, in fact, he had to do absolutely nothing at all uh, because there is no energy in the universe and that zero energy is with us now, although it doesn't look like that. So there's God's job on day one. Why anything happens, can I have two minutes? Um, <laughs> why anything happens is, um, of course, the second law of thermodynamics, which was C.P. Snow, another chemist, C.P. Snow's um, uh, litmus test of scientific literacy that saying that not knowing the second law of thermodynamics is not like not knowing, never having read a, a play by Shakespeare. Totally meaningless analogy these days, of course. That <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, uh, the second law is held, I'm sure that Snow didn't understand the second law either. Um, but all it says, of course, is that things get worse. Um, and in other words, and I think it's such a, I, when I start my lectures to my erstwhile undergraduates at Oxford, I would say, having bored them with the first law, when I get to the second law, I say something like, no other law of science has contributed more to the liberation of the human spirit. And I think that's true. And um, this is uh, really developing a, a, a a point made yesterday about, this, about, about this, 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 the second law. And I just want to try to show you that you can understand the second law and all its magnificence pictorially. And I think that's the way of conveying scientific insight. This is what you never see. I mean, you never see this. Um, what you do see, of course, is things getting worse. And that is the natural direction of change. And it accounts for just about everything. Um, there, in summary, is um, the second law. Energy and matter tend to disperse in disorder. 
This could be the fuel of an engine, this, the products of the combustion, including the energy which disperses. You may be able to tap into that process and use it to construct entities. So providing the world, the world will get worse, but locally there may be abatements of chaos. These might be real bricks being turned into a, a real organized building. But they could also, this could be the processes that take place, the nuclear processes that take place on the sun. So that, and the dispersal here, due to the release of energy under, in nuclear fusion, can be captured by the biochemical processes of photosynthesis. And out of carbon dioxide and water and so on, vegetation grows. The vegetation, so what we have that image, which I think is um, moving towards high kitsch. I warned you that I would end on a note of high kitsch. Um, but this could be the vegetation. That is, it could be breakfast. Some breakfasts are more vegetation than others, but this could be breakfast. This is the met metabolic processes going on inside us. These could be amino acids, which by the biochemical processes lead to a protein. So as we eat, so we grow. Or it could be the growth of a particular organ. And more fancy, so we've gone really now through this process. And so um, the... But this could also be the random electrical and chemical processes taking place within our brain, which, because we eat, we think. And the processes that occur in here, driven by the processes there, could be the kitsch that I had mentioned right at the beginning. That is, acts of creativity, acts of understanding, and acts of everything. So I think the second law is something really worthwhile sharing with the general public because they see that really collapse into chaos can be fantastically constructive. This point uh, came out yesterday a little bit. And finally, um, I wondered if Beyond Belief ought to have a flag. Um, and I mean, the United States has got a flag. Um, European Union's got a flag, not this flag, but um, and really, I wondered what I would put in the flag, what design I would use to capture what I believe to be the essence of modern science and its contribution to, um, to, um, to, to the Enlightenment too. And what I'd like to suggest goes in here, and I'm giving you time to think about what that might be, is <laughs> um, something like that. Because I really do think it captures the essence of what science is all about and something that we should never let go of. Um, in the first place, these sort of factual diagrams, as people will be aware, are, if you like, art without end. That if you take any little region and you magnify it, unlike magnifying the Mona Lisa, where you get just a little blob of paint, you get the same pattern effectively in that region. And you can of course, magnify that magnified region and get, once again, something that is similar to this. And you can do that forever. And I think that captures one of the essences of science, that it is of boundless richness and that there will never be an end to the applications and illumination that it brings. The second point, of course, is that these images are generated on a computer, of course, using a very simple little formula, which is explored time and time again. So, in other words, this enormous, this infinite complexity grows from a, a seed of infinite simplicity. And I think that captures the essence of what I was saying earlier on, that we have to convey the sense that astonishing complexity can emerge from astonishing simplicity. And the third point that I think the flag captures is that, at least to my mind, this is very beautiful. And I think that science is very beautiful. And I think that humanity should be extraordinarily proud to have settled upon this method, the only method we have of discovering 
the real truth about the universe. Thank you very much. We, we, we could take some questions before, um, uh, since you've probably enraged half the philosophers in the room. Um, what about the half of philosophers I haven't? <laughs> <laughs> um, can we... Uh, which, where, where are you going? That's fine. Yeah, I, I'm, con <clears throat> I'm concerned, I would not say alarmed, by the pride... Um, in your argument, and I'm 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 in favor of of uh, proper self respect, but as a Christian, I'm I'm very alert to idolatry and to self idolatry, which is the master sin of pride. So, could you t tell me, are you also concerned about pride in, the, in, this, in, this, in this evil and hazardous sense? Well, I'm, uh, I don't see why pride should be evil. I think we should be, if we've got something that is fantastic and good that we have developed, which is turns out to be a way of answering all the deep questions that have ever been asked about the nature of the world, one that is um, uh, capable of developing applications that enhance our lives, save, save our lives, do everything that science does, then we have every reason not to feel humble. Um, and I think we should go beyond that. We should feel proud that we have um, reached discovered this, this tool for understanding. Um, now, I don't see where um, the, the Christian sense of um, pride before a fall um, plays a role in that. And let's, you... be, let's be self-confident. Let's say that we've got intellects that are capable of discovering the truth. I, I, I uh, half agree with you, but uh, the other half is concerned about the c corrosive um, I yeah, I don't think, um, ethical consequences of pride. Yeah, but um, we have to be cautious with our knowledge. I, I don't um, deny that. But that doesn't mean to say we should not be proud to have acquired that knowledge. Beautiful talk. It goes without saying. Um, <clears throat> um, I think this is, oh yes, it is working. Uh, you, you, of course, started with this unbelievably beautiful question on the nature of nothing. Uh, for those of us who have not read your thoughts on nothing, uh, I would just like to uh, ask you one question that is going to sound very strange. Uh, is nothing and everything, uh, are they really that different? I think they're the same. Okay, so, so some of history is not I think that would need to be unwrapped. No, 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 but had any fine. I, I yes. understand then. Absolutely, yes. thank you. Yes. Talk to you later. I, I'd just like to uh, continue with the, what Deidre uh, said about pride and would like to recommend this book by Eugenie Scott, who's the director of the National Center for Science Education. The book is titled Evolution and Creationism. She's, of course, an atheist, just like the rest of us, but she has... Not one there. Oh, not... Okay, no. Uh, I'm sorry. That's the trouble. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm, I'm also a theist, by the way. My, my, I'm, I'm a dualist. But, no, but, but she's the... <laughs> yeah, actually, Stan, you should, you should not make that assumption about this room. You'd be surprised. <laughs> right. I, I, she is in the business of trying to deal with what's going on in the high schools of the United States and has developed a approach that is not offensive to um, religious people. And it's, it is a delicate, delicate and very important topic that uh, yeah, one brings you, up. I, I, think, I think there are... Um, could you pass it to Rebecca in front of you? No, <laughs> Yeah, if I could just make a comment on that. I think there are um, 
two ways forward. One is when one is in a group like this, where anything goes, and you're not trying to make a political point. And the other is where you need to mould society. And I would be much more cautious in what I said, even though I know this is being broadcast. <laughs> But yes, there is a um, secretive gathering. Quite, uh, I mean, there's only three million people watching this now. And <laughs> that's only one 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 percent of uh, the population here. So. <laughs> but I think you have to be cautious in, to achieve anything. Could I ask you um, just to just to put to rest the, 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 my quick my query, which a lot of people have asked about, on the on the Templeton ad thing. Um, what was the thought process that you jo decided to join in with that? Money. But, Oh, okay. Right. I didn't know they did that. <laughs> I didn't know. That. I mean, they made quite a good offer, oh, really? and uh, uh, it worked out you know, for a lot of dollars a word. Um, oh, and, so you commissioned and I, an It essay. did seem to me that there would be. They asked you to be start your answer with one word. You know, yes, no, maybe yeah. something like that. Right. Um, and I thought that there would be so many people saying yes or don't know. And if you were to do a count there, I think yeah. that's justified, that it, it needed someone to say unequivocally no, taking the view that you know, any, a question like what is, if, is, is there a purpose, and it is an entirely invented question. Yeah, Larry Krauss was, Lawrence Krauss was an unlikely... And hmm, you see, yeah. wishy-washy. Yeah. Um, so I, th I felt it needed... Um, a slight balance. Oh, okay, so I'm on. Sorry, right. Rebecca. Yes. Um, so I really like your way of distinguishing between philosophers and scientists. Uh, philosophers tend to be Rebecca. more pessimistic and general nuisances. And so I will try my best to be a philosopher and be a nuisance. Um, when you say that um, philosophy has been superseded by Science. I, I suppose you're using philo uh, uh, philosophy in a very narrow sense, that is, as a description of the world. And yes. in that sense, of course, science is, is a description of the world. Exactly. It is proved to be uh, yes. our most reliable description of the world. Of course, you realize that in making that claim, you're making an epistemological claim, you're going outside of science, you're making a philosophical claim. Yes. There's no way to exercise philosophy uh, because even in trying to exercise it in this way, yes. you are making a philosophical claim. You've, it's self-refuting. Yeah, but I was not at the time trying to do science. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm just pointing out the, the differences between the attitudes, in my view, of a philosopher and a scientist. Sure, and in and doing I think so, you're that being a philosopher. A philosopher is 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 is, um, is a sea anchor, whereas a scientist is a sail. Good. And, and, and just actually one no more one more point, which is, um, you know, this is of course this old question that you're saying science is now going to be able to answer. Why is there something rather than nothing I think which uh, philosophers have been... I just, yeah. Dave Albert yesterday had mentioned... I'm prepared our, to stick my neck out and yeah. say that I don't think there's any real question that begins with the word why. I think every why question should actually be deconstructed into how questions. Again, an epistemological yeah, point. True. Yes, right. Yeah. But I, I did but just... You only, and yeah. you only make progress yeah. when you ask questions beginning how. You never make progress with questions beginning why. Perhaps. Um, that, that, sure. that, that, it's, <laughs> that itself is... Yeah. What? is isn't that itself not a how question, that claim you've just made? Yeah. Yeah. No, no, uh, but how do we make progress, I would... Uh, okay. All right. I, would, I guess there's always right. well, a way well, of putting it. Final comment from Sean Carroll, then we have to move on to Harry. Thanks. I thought... so. I, here I am. Yeah. That, I thought that was a great talk and makes me hope that someday we can have a really in-depth conversation about Nothing at all. energy and entropy and cosmology and complexity and the arrow of time and, and so forth. I just wanted to clarify the one thing you said, because I think I might have given a false impression of what I'm saying about the eternity of the universe, uh, the idea that the Big Bang came from some pre-existing universe, yeah. yes, but then it's not that and that pre-existing universe had its own Big Bang, and that pre-existing universe had its own Big Bang, and it's turtles all the way down, therefore we don't need to know what happened at the beginning. It's that there, is, there are some universes, at least one, maybe an infinite number, that never banged, that simply existed forever, and 
toward the future, they created an infinite number of little baby universes, and likewise to the past, yeah. they create a, tr a large number of baby universes, and therefore, in fact, the growth of entropy proceeds indefinitely both toward the future and the past, and everything is symmetric. Mm. I, would be, I think that if there were an attempt to just say, and, and there are, uh, people talk about the cyclic universe, yeah. that you have a similar ha thing happening in the same direction of time forever and ever, and therefore we don't need to explain the beginning, that would be deeply unsatisfying. Yes. Um, I mean, that is the real joy of cosmology, isn't it? That um, one can think anything at this stage because there is so little evidence about anything. <laughs> but um, but I, I, what I wanted to do, and I, I apologize for slightly misrepresenting you, on, this was, I think, representing another slightly different point of view, um, is that I wanted to put into the ring the thought that there is yet another approach, namely thinking about nothing. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. yeah.